All right, welcome. Welcome to Power Your Plate. As I said before, my name is John Vredenberg. I am your leader today, and I will be walking you through all of the ins and outs about healthful eating. We're going to talk about how to set up your plate for more healthful food choices, how to navigate some really confusing food labels. It's pretty intimidating out there. There's like 20,000 products on a grocery shelf. So I'll show you some simple tips and tricks that work for me and my family uh, to help ensure that I'm getting the best choices um, for my nutrition dollar. And then lastly, we'll spend some time talking about some weight management tips. So for those of you that are joining us live, I always encourage you to ask questions along the way, because chances are, if you have a question, someone else is probably thinking it too. And I think for the best results here, I would just ask that you drop those questions into the chat and then I will reread them and make sure everyone understands that we're all on the same page. So again, welcome. Let's talk about food in general. So when we look at all the different approaches to healthy eating, this is the bottom line that I want you to remember here. The healthiest food choices for you may be different than the healthiest food choices for someone else. We're all individuals. We all have different nutritional and health related goals. So what, what, what might work for one person may not work for the best person. And the reason I say this is a lot of times we tend to gravitate towards media or social media posts about the best approaches to eating, whether it's keto, whether it's intermittent fasting, whether it's eating like whatever a lion would eat, whatever it is, the bottom line, the best approach is the one that's going to help you meet your health-related goals and still like your life. And that's the thing. You still have to enjoy life, and food is a big part of our life. And what I try to tell people is that you know, when we look at all the different ways to eat, most of the research is pretty consistent. And what you see on your slide here shouldn't surprise you. But when we look at all the available research on food choices and the types of dietary approaches, for health and well being, there are some common denominators. There's some common products that we see time and time again. Of course, your fruits, your vegetables, but also beans and legumes and yogurt and fish and whole grains. So, understand, under, pay attention to that. I, under, I uh, underlined the word whole because when we look at all the grain products that are available, many of the ones that are on our grocery store shelves are of those refined grain types. So the fiber, that healthful fiber is removed. So that's why I underline whole there. And of course, some people are sensitive to some of those grains. So that might not be for everyone. So again, this is all presented as general nutrition information, not meant to contradict anything that your physician or dietitian may have prescribed for you individually. But overall, by and large, if we have diets that are built on these foundation foods, we're on the right track towards health and well-being. And when we look at it in terms of a spectrum of beneficial or harmful, this is a graphic that I've used several times. And for those of you that have been in some of our heart disease prevention classes and other programs that I've led, it may look familiar to you. And what this is, is a, a compilation of research studies, observational studies that looked at dietary patterns and how they're correlated with rates of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and obesity. Now, again, as any good researchers will tell you, correlation doesn't mean cause, but there are some recurring themes that we see when certain food choices are appearing more often in a person's diet. So for example, diets that feature a lot of starchy foods or sugars or processed meats. So think of things like bacon and sausage and such. Higher sodium foods, all of our processed snack food items and those refined grains that are mentioned, those tend to be more harmful to our health and well-being. And then of course, all the things that I mentioned before, the fruits, the nuts, the vegetable oils, the beans, the yogurt, et cetera, those are more beneficial. But what I want you to pay close attention to is that middle area. So you see cheese, who, who doesn't love cheese, right? Eggs, chicken, turkey, milk, butter, unprocessed red meat. So that would be just your regular steaks and things like that. Um, those seem to have a more neutral impact 
on our rates of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and obesity. Doesn't mean they're helpful. Doesn't mean they're healthy. Also doesn't mean they're unhealthy. And this is something that I try to make a point of getting across to people is that, you know, nutrition's often not black and white. There aren't lists of absolute no's and absolute yeses when we look at food choices. So I try more often than not to try to categorize foods as healthy and unhealthy because I think it's too confusing. Think of uh, a good example of this would be olive oil. So yeah, olive oil is a healthful food choice. It does have some properties for our health, but if I'm over consuming it, it's very high in calories and could put me at risk for obesity. So I try to minimize my use, believe it or not, of, of the words healthy and unhealthy for individual foods. Instead, I look at the big picture. And when we look at the big picture and how we put a healthful plate together, there are three nutrients that you probably heard a lot about. Let's talk about it for a minute. Carbohydrates. One of our favorite nutrients, right? Well, we know about carbohydrates is they're loaded with fiber if they're unprocessed. They also are a good fuel source for instant energy and fuel for our brain. So if you're doing a lot of physical activity, a lot of walking or, or a leisurely activity like bike riding, this is the type of fuel that your muscles are using to get you through that activity. There's not a magic number as far as what percent of your calories should come from carbohydrates. So again, there's a lot of individual variability there. So you could have a very low carbohydrate diet and still be very healthy. But when we look at putting a plate together, that's one of the primary purposes of those carbohydrate rich foods like brown rice and whole wheat pasta and whole grain bread and as well as potatoes and corn and things of those nature. Protein. So I think we're all familiar with where we find protein. There's a lot of attention now more on plant-based sources of protein. I think there's a lot of favorable research to show that, yes, if we can minimize or, or limit excess consumption of some of those processed meats or those large portions of, of fattier meats like the chicken wings and, and the um, prime rib, that could be better for our heart in the long run. But we also know protein is very important for helping us build and repair our muscles and cells in terms of our overall um, nutrition content. So when we look at protein, there's been some research showing that as we get older, we need to pay even more closer attention to protein because adequate amount of dietary protein can help preserve lean body mass, even in absence of regular strength training. So even if you aren't getting to the gym with regular basis, if you're consuming adequate protein, that can help preserve it to some extent. And if we can preserve that muscle function, that also improves our overall health and longevity, just being able to get up out of our chair, being able to bend over, making us more uh, resistant to injuries and falls and, and help us uh, maintain our overall strength. So it's important to make sure protein is a regular component of your diet. And we'll look at proportions of protein, but generally speaking, you know, it doesn't take much to meet our needs. Maybe a three to four ounce portion of protein at your key meals like lunch and dinner is all that's really necessary. And then of course, fat. Fat plays a very important role in addition to transporting fat-soluble vitamins. It also keeps our meals tasting good. Let's face it, you had a, you had any low-fat cheese or reduced-fat products, it doesn't taste too good. So fat adds flavor. It promotes a feeling of fullness. It promotes satiety. So again, making sure that we're getting good flavor from our foods. And again, these all work together. You know, if I'm looking at trying to put together a healthful plate for myself, I try to feature something from each of these key nutrient categories. And I'm sure you do the same. When we look at it, though, if I'm trying to illustrate this in more practical terms. Let's look at a plate. Let's look at a plate of food. So many of you may be familiar with the My Plate. That's the USDA template there for healthy eating. I like this version a little bit better. And I, the reason I like it is because it, it names names and also includes healthy oils. You know, so things like olive and canola oil uh, can be a very healthful component to our day-to-day -day routine of nutritional intake. But of course, balancing our plates between fruits and vegetables, 
whole grains and healthy proteins, but it gives you some specific ideas as to what would be included in terms of the protein choices and the whole grains. And then also gives you some guidance in terms of what your beverage of choice should be. Water, tea, or coffee. And it, look at that terminology there. Limit milk and dairy to one to two servings a day. So the Harvard Healthy Eating Plate has more of a research focus to it. Most of the available research will suggest that we do not need three servings of milk per day, that we can easily meet our calcium requirements by including plenty of fresh produce. And if we want to include milk or dairy, one to two servings a day would be adequate. This is where some debate comes in, because if you look at the Harvard, or excuse me, the traditional um, my plate, it just features vegetables, fruits, grains, protein, and dairy. So we'll look at that a little bit later. Uh, but the big difference between the Harvard plate, the one that you're looking at, and the my plate is that there's a lot of industry influence in the USDA guidelines. So that's why you see such an emphasis on dairy, because there's a very big dairy lobby in this country. And this is why you also wouldn't see overt recommendations to limit red meat and cheese because of the meat industry. So there's a lot of debate as to what goes into developing some of these guidelines. Is it science-based? Is it industry influence? And this is where it can be even more frustrating and con and confusing as a consumer. But I've looked at all of the, the teaching tools that are out there that are available and balancing out what's going to be objective science and evidence-based nutrition. And I still think this particular tool this particular visual here is one of the better ways to at least educate on healthy eating from a general basis. Now, again, as I said from the outset, we're all individuals. We all have different nutritional needs. But generally speaking, uh, a, a plate that approaches nutrition from these different categories and these types of portions is more often than not going to be considered a very healthful pattern for you and your family. But as you know, we don't really eat like this, do we? So let's just look like in real food terms. All right, well, let's take a look here. So here you got quarter protein, quarter whole grains, and half of fruits and vegetables there. All right, so does that look good? Is anyone eating lunch right now, by the way? Am I the only one that's not eating and getting hungry by looking at all this food? So again, yeah, a great example of what that would translate to in real food terms, but we're all different, right? We all have different backgrounds. Food is a big part of our our culture, a big part of our heritage. So maybe this doesn't look familiar to any of you. Maybe we want something that's a little bit more relatable. Maybe I like good Southern cooking. So here you got quarter of protein, quarter of starch, half of vegetable. So you got your collard greens, a little bit of mac and cheese, a little bit of chicken, and you can see the difference there. So it's tailored towards different types of food choices. Maybe I like, maybe I come from a, um, a Latino background. So here you have a little bit of guacamole, some beans and starch from the tortilla, the protein represented, I think, probably there from chicken and some pico de gallo. So again, looking at it from different heritages, different types of cultures and how that would look like in real food terms. But you can see the common denominator there, an abundance of produce. So that should not come as a surprise when we look at the most healthful diets, the most healthful nutrition prescriptions that are available out there, they feature a, an abundance of plant-based foods. Don't have to be completely vegetarian, but featuring them in prominence is continuing to be one of the best ways towards maintaining a healthy weight and reducing our risk and burden of chronic disease. So when we look at getting that variety, you know, uh, fruits and vegetables, you know, the more color, the better. They all have their own individual micronutrients with health benefits. So if we can eat a variety, great. Don't stress out over getting organic produce. I mean, I think as long as you're getting any kind of fruit and vegetable in your diet, that's great. If you want to choose organic foods, that's fine too, but you can get just as much nutritional benefit from conventionally grown produce. If you're worried about some type of uh, residues and things like that, as long as you're rinsing it very carefully and very deliberately before you're serving it, you should be just fine. As I said before, in terms of whole grains, look closely at the nutrition ingredients. You want to see that word whole in there. That means it's using the entire grain. 
which includes that very healthful and nutrient rich uh, dietary fiber. So you see some additional examples there. Moderate amounts of lean protein. So, uh, you know, generally speaking, if I look at protein choices, I'm always of the mindset the less legs it has, the better. Uh, so I tend to include more fish, more poultry in my diet than I do beef or pork. Doesn't mean I never eat a hamburger, but it just, uh, I'm trying to explain the frequency of certain foods in, in my particular diet. And then of course, of course, including healthy fats. So all avocados, olive oil, olives, vegetable oils, fattier uh, types of fish like salmon and tuna. And then of course, nuts and seeds. But remember when we look at these foods, we call them healthy types of fats, but you still need to pay very close attention to portion size, which is of course, one of the more confusing concepts to grasp, let's face it. I mean, is, is, a, is a serving size the same as a portion size? I mean, when I'm reading food labels, which we'll look at in a moment, it all lists serving sizes, but then it'll also have a pretty low serving size. Like for ice cream, I have half a cup, but you could probably eat that in one bite, right? So is that really my portion size? And that's where it can be a little bit confusing. So when we look at portion sizes, if we decided we wanted to use portion sizes as our guide instead of the actual plate itself, then there's some different numbers that are considered to be daily quantities. So for example, for portion sizes for, for uh, grains and starches, maybe six ounces a day, all right, or two and a half cups of vegetables or two cups of fruit. So those are some of the numbers that you'll often see that I'll share with you on the, on the My Plate Daily Checklist. But it's one thing to know what the portion size might be for a common food. It's another thing to actually be able to duplicate that. You know, I want to try to make the mealtime experience a little bit less frustrating and not task you to carry around measuring cups everywhere you go. But if we look at it compared to common objects, so one cup, that's about the size of your fist or a baseball. So if you're having you know, one cup of pasta on a quarter of your plate there, that's about the portion size for that. Uh, a one ounce portion, which is a common portion size for things like cheeses or peanut butters, uh, that's about the size of your thumb or a large poker chip. Three ounces, that's about the size of a deck of cards or the palm of your hand. And that's a common portion size for meat. So some ideas when we look at trying to compare portion sizes to everyday objects, but it's not the exact same thing as a serving size, which we'll, which we'll talk about with the food labels. So here, this is from a Texas uh, good food promotion. It talks about really trying to limit certain products for blood sugar control. And I find it ironic because it talks about limiting pasta servings to half a cup about the size of your fist, which is may or may not be true. Uh, but it also talks about limiting, uh, it talks about a fist being a one cup serving uh, or a double serving of ice cream. So I, I just like this because it, it shows you that even the best laid intentions can be somewhat deceptive there. So uh, I don't know if a fist is one cup, or half a cup. So your guess is as good as mine, but just wanted to share that with you. I um, went to the USDA website. So we talk about setting up our plate, trying to power our plate, making sure it has the right amount of fruits and vegetables and grains and protein and dairy. So this is, remember, the USDA checklist or the USDA My Plate. And this is the one I said that has a little bit more industry influence in its development. Doesn't mean it's overtly wrong, but you'll see some specific mentions of dairy products and routine admissions of, of not saying, hey, you should limit your processed red meat. So just wanted to point that out, but this shows you the daily quantities for 2000 calories each day. So two cups, so two fistfuls of fruit a day. And two and a half fistfuls of vegetables each day and six ounces of grains. And here are the USDA guidelines are make half your grains whole. And I'm saying, hey, why not make all your grains whole? Five and a half ounces of protein. So roughly the size of two decks of playing cards. And then of course the difference, big difference between this template and this plate versus the Harvard one 
is it's actually saying get three cups of dairy versus one to two servings each day. And then, of course, recommendations are being made for what to eat less of, especially sodium, saturated fat, and added sugars. Uh, sodium, 2,300 milligrams a day. Saturated fat, 22 grams a day. I know it's a lot of numbers. I don't want you to feel like you need to memorize them, but I'm just trying to explain what each of these numbers are coming from and added sugars to 50 grams per day. So 50 grams of added sugars is a pretty high amount. I would say I would try to limit it to about half that if you could. But what I really try to teach people, rather than trying to obsess over individual nutrients, we know that we want to try to eat less sodium, less saturated fat, less added sugar. I don't want you to feel like you have to memorize all these different guidelines for a daily quantity. What I would instead challenge you to do is take a look at what you're already purchasing. Take a look at what you're already getting in the grocery store and do some comparison shopping for sodium, for added sugar, and for uh, saturated fat. See if you can find lower versions of it amongst foods that you're already choosing. That seems to be the more practical way to approach some of your food choices because you're already going to be using foods that your family may be willing to eat and you're not having to wreck your brain over specific numbers and specific targets. And this is where the food label can be one of your best allies if you let it. Don't let it be too overwhelming. Don't let it be too frustrating. Instead, look at it from a four-part basis. So the first piece of information is the most important, serving size. So again, what this is just referring to doesn't mean you can only have one cup of this product or half a cup of this product or three crackers of this product. It's just telling you that every number that you see below it is based on that specific portion of food. The FDA has tried to, the Food and Drug Administration has tried to uh, police, if you will, for lack of a better word, some of these serving sizes. So they are a little bit more realistic to our usual portion sizes, but again, they're not one and the same. So just take a close look at that specific serving size and see how it compares to what you're actually going to eat. The second piece of information that's very important, again, are the calories. If we're trying to Approach a healthy weight, how many calories we consume are a big part of that. So this has done a good job at, at making that information pretty prominent. There was a recent uh, development, I think maybe five years ago now, where they increased the font size for calories. So it's even more prominent. The third piece of helpful information are the nutrients. So dietary fiber, carbohydrate, sodium, cholesterol, total fat, protein, your vitamins, and certain minerals are all listed on the food label. They're not always going to be on every single label, but when they are listed, your vitamins and minerals, if they're not part of a breakfast cereal or if they're not part of a food that has been fortified otherwise, these are going to be the default nutrients because these have been deemed potential shortfall nutrients in the American diet. Vitamin D, calcium, iron, and potassium. So doesn't mean we're all deficient in them, but when we look at food trends and food surveys, these are the nutrients that Americans don't always get all of what they need. So this is just telling you what this particular serving size is providing for these four key nutrients. Then lastly, you'll also see this percent daily value. What this is referring to is how much of this serving size, this one cup serving of, I think this is actually a frozen lasagna, if I'm not mistaken. What does this one cup of lasagna cover for me in specific nutrient targets over the course of the day? Uh, these are all based on a 2,000 calorie a day diet. It's not. It's just for general nutrition advice. So this, again, this could actually be, meet more of your needs or less of your needs based on what your overall uh, calorie needs might be. Quick reference there, 5% or less is considered low, 20% or more is considered high. So again, just give you some perspective on what this percent daily value is referring to. The one key thing to keep in mind, actually, I don't know if it's too vitally important, but 
when we look at sodium goals and cholesterol goals, these are the same for everybody, no matter how many calories you're consuming. So these numbers are going to remain this, these percentages are going to remain pretty consistent across multiple calorie levels. Uh, I think the sodium is comparing itself to 2,300 milligrams a day. And then cholesterol is, uh, the limit has been set at 300 milligrams per day. So you'll see that across the board if you're consuming 1,500 calories, 2,000 calories, or you know, 2,500 calories a day. But again, general information on how to diagram and dissect a food label. But as many of you know, that's not what we see right away when we go to the grocery store. We see the package. And this is where you have to be careful. Food labels are a very valuable marketing tool, but don't be sold on these claims. You see all kinds of various claims on food labels. Fruit is our first ingredient. Well, I should hope so. These are fruit snacks. It's made with real fruit as opposed to, I don't know what, fake fruit or plastic fruit. And it gives you excellent source of vitamin A, C, and E, no preservatives. It's gluten-free. Maybe it even says the rainforest. I don't know. All I'm telling you here is I want you to disregard all of the stuff on the front of the package from now on. In order to stay informed as a consumer, this is only going to make you more confused. Just look at the nutrition facts and the ingredients. We already talked about the nutrition facts. Let's look at these ingredients. So it says fruit is the first ingredient. It is. It's fruit puree, all right, which is very close to fruit juice. Second ingredient is corn syrup. The third ingredient is sugar. The fourth ingredient is modified cornstarch, which is another type of sweetener. So three of the four, four ingredients in these fruit snacks, using those air quotes, are actually types of added sugar. And you see that reflected right here. This is the added sugar. So again, fruit naturally has some sugar in it, but what we want to try to limit in our diets overall are the added sugars. So again, big numbers there. Uh, so something to be mindful of. So a lot of times foods are promoted as being healthier food choices. Uh, 2013 General Mills had a big campaign pushing these as healthier brands of certain types of food products. But you can see here, 12 grams of sugar in this, 18 grams of sugar in yogurt, 16 grams of sugar in cereal. All together, these exceed our daily recommendation of you know 25 to 36 grams of sugar, depending on who you ask. Uh, easily with those three products. So just something to be mindful of as you're navigating through the store. All right, moving right along, snacks. Raise your hand if you snack a lot. I'm raising my hand right now. I'm, I'm a big time snacker and snacks are a very important part of our diet. They can actually help us meet our nutritional needs. Uh, if they're timed right, they can be part of a healthy diet. But the thing to remember about snacks is when we look at it in the context of our day-to-day -day nutritional intakes, are you eating because you're hungry or are you eating because you're bored? And in order to, to truthfully answer that question, keep in mind some general numbers there. So when you eat lunch today, or if you're eating it now, or if you eat dinner, if you're, if you're, you're including a variety of foods, you know, foods that have carbs, proteins, and fats, like we talked about, it's going to take about three to four hours to digest. So if it's appropriately balanced, you should not be hungry again until that time has gone by, all right? So a sensible snack can make sense to hold you over until your next meal. So if you're eating lunch now or if you're eating lunch right after this class and you're scheduled to eat dinner around maybe six or seven o'clock, then yeah, it makes sense to be hungry again around four o'clock today. So keep in mind some of those timelines because this can really help you differentiate between hunger and actual cravings. So snacks can be a big part of our diet. I just try to help people, you know, look for snacks that, that give you something back, give you a little bit of protein to help feel you fuller longer or dietary fiber. Try to limit those snacks, obviously that are lower in added sugar and added fats, i.e. everything in our vending machines. Uh, some examples, and again, this is by no means a conclusive list, but things like those string cheeses, uh, whole grain crackers with nut butter, hummus, and veggies. So all three of those are giving me protein and or fiber, which are those key nutrients that help us keep feeling fuller longer. As far as calorie guidelines go, so if you're evaluating snack choices, looking at the nutrition facts label, 
you know, by and large, I'd say maybe about 200 calories. Again, that's not a hard ceiling by any means. So don't feel you have to throw out all of your snacks that are 210 calories. But if you're less active, that's a general guideline that can be applied to some of those snack choices. Uh, but again, two questions. Does this give me a nutritional benefit? And am I hungry? And if you are truly hungry, that's going to be something that gradually builds up. And if, like I said, if it's been three to four hours since your last meal, chances are that might be hunger. If it's something that happens spontaneously, like when your office mate popped a bag of microwave popcorn, then chances are that's a craving and that will pass temporarily. So things to keep in mind. So the last part of the of today's session here and to keep us on track, I think we've uh, allotted 45 minutes for this particular program. So I want to make sure there is time to answer questions. But let's talk about weight management. So when we look at methods for weight management, this is really where I want to draw attention towards maintaining an approach where you get your goals met and you still like your life. So the people can lose weight a variety of ways. The most effective weight loss programs are the ones that you can sustain over the long haul. So there isn't one magical diet per se that's going to work for every single person. What is available, though, is the National Weight Control Registry. So this is a service that is tracking over 10,000 people who have lost significant amounts of weight. And more importantly, they've kept it off. All right. So a lot of people have lost weight, but very few have been able to keep it off. So this is basically a, a group of people that have been tracked over the years because they've had successfully been able to maintain weight that has lost. And notice some of the commonalities for this group of people. 98% modified their food choices, so that's not surprising. 94% increased physical activity. 78% eat breakfast every day. 75% weigh themselves at least once a week. So again, if you're of the mindset and management that what gets measured gets managed, this makes sense too. Here's some other interesting facts. 62% wash less than 10 hours of TV each week. I have um, often wondered aloud when people tell me all the cool shows that they are watching on Netflix or HBO Max, and I ask them, are they able to find time for 30 minutes of physical activity each day, then they quickly uh, are not able to find time. So we prioritize what's important to us. And in this National Weight Control Registry, people are watching a lot less television than those that are not trying to lose the weight. And then 90% on average are, are getting about one hour of physical activity each day. So it's not really anything earth shattering. You know, it's not like, oh my God, I can't believe that. that if you watch less TV, you might be uh, more successful at losing weight. But it's just important to see how common it was among people who have consistently been able to lose weight and keep it off. And then you can ask yourself, if you are trying to lose a little bit of weight, which of those behaviors most closely resembles what you're doing now and what, what, you're, what are you willing to adopt? If we look at it from a nutritional standpoint, here are some strategies that I've found helpful uh, for talking people through uh, nutrition counseling for weight loss. So if you take your meals and you're combining ample amounts of lean protein, so maybe more of a, uh, not a palm of the hand size portion of meat, but maybe the whole hand size portion of meat, along with high fiber, that meal combination really does a good job at helping promote satiety, making sure that feeling of fullness is lasting a full four to five hours to get you through your meals, and then also limiting those refined starches, the white rice, the white pasta, the white breads, which you know we know they don't have fiber, and because they don't have fiber, they're actually very easy to overconsume. But you also want to take a close look at those starches that are refined and also added with fat. And again, this is where we get into the macaroni uh, and cheese, the macaroni salads, the mashed potatoes with gravy. You know, those are the things that we really want to be mindful of in terms of portion size. Also, take a look at what you're drinking, you know, whether it's alcohol or other calorie containing beverages like sodas and and juices, those are some things that can really contribute a lot of empty calories to our diets. And I will tell you that when I look at secret sources of sugar in our diet, fruit juice is near the top of the list. And I'm not saying that there aren't any nutrients in fruit juice, but it's going to be much more healthful 
for you in terms of weight management if you were eating your fruit rather than drinking it because uh you know uh eight ounce glass of orange juice can easily approach 130 calories. And if you get them an even a larger portion, which a lot of your restaurant glasses are gonna be 12 to 16 ounces, you can uh, easily gulp down 200 plus calories of fruit juice before you even get started on your meal. Take a look at your trigger foods. And, and what I mean by that is that we all have our weaknesses from a nutritional standpoint. Uh, mine is Cheetos. So if I see Cheetos, I might overconsume those. So I try to keep those out of my line of sight. Uh, but things like Oreos and Pringles and a lot of your processed snack foods that are engineered to get us to overconsume, just try to keep those out of the house if you can, if you're trying to lose weight, because it's tough to pick between apples and oranges versus Doritos on any day of the week. So you might find better success by trying to just limit them in general in your house, period. Other things that can help uh, developing weekly menus to help with shopping and help minimize that impulsive dining out tendency and, and tell your friends, say, hey, look, I'm just trying to eat more healthy. So I'd appreciate it if you support me there when we, when we get together and, and we're trying to eat as a group of, of friends and family. And then, as I said before, try to learn to differentiate the hunger from the cravings. So cravings come on pretty quickly. Hunger builds gradually over the course of a couple of hours. And then lastly, but not least, please know that for Gator Care members, we do have nutrition counseling services available. So if you want to talk to a dietitian, uh, we can provide that service for you. Or if you have questions about your personal health plan and how you can access a dietitian, I'd be willing to assist you with that as well. All right, so a couple of take home points. And again, if you have questions, throw them in the chat there and we can answer them. But you know, again, the best plate for you is the one that keeps you healthy and happy, right? What's going to help you still like your life while you meet your health related goals? If you can prepare more meals at home whenever possible, not only are you going to save a lot of money, but you're also going to be in control of your nutritional intake. Another thing is, and I didn't talk about this in the actual presentation here, but how you eat is just as important as what you eat. And this is really building on Olivia's talk on mindful eating, trying to really stop and pay attention to what you're eating, enjoying the flavors of your food and setting aside time for that meal rather than sitting in front of your computer trying to respond to emails as you mindlessly chomp on whatever lunch that you have put in front of yourself there so when you can try to stop multitasking and, and eat to enjoy pay attention to your hunger signals and then stop when you are satisfied okay so the other thing i wanted to talk about here is when we look at weight management um, this is where the what gets measured gets managed. So if you are trying to lose weight, I found that you know measuring your weight on a weekly basis is one way to do it. Not the only way, but it can be helpful as long as you don't micromanage it. What I mean by that is measuring it every single day because our weight can fluctuate greatly from one day to the next. So if you want a, a assistance with weight management, a, a weekly weight can be helpful, but also Believe it or not, a food diary can be just as helpful. So taking a look at what your food choices are, writing them down also keeps you more in tune with what you're eating, making you more aware of that. So this is how food journaling can be very important too. So that's it for today's session. Um, as I said before, if you have questions, throw them in the chat. We can answer them. But also watch your email for copies of these slides and links to all the recordings. And we will also send out a final survey at the end of this four-part program. And that's what we're going to use to process points for the wellness credit. So thank you very much. I'll hang out in the lobby to answer any questions that come up. And until then, I will see you next week when we will be talking about grocery shopping and meal prepping tips and tricks.